If you turn with me, please, in the Word of God in the Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, begin reading at verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said to them, Until what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. I'd like to ask you a question this morning, and that is simply this. Have you received since you believed? Have you received since you have believed? As Paul returned back to the city of Ephesus, he was met with 12 men who professed to be disciples, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, but there was something drastically missing from their life and from their experience. We understand from the Bible, some writers believe that these men were disciples of John the Baptist. But in all truthfulness and fairness, when you look into the book of Acts, every time that Luke talked about a disciple, it was always in the context of a follower of Jesus Christ, a believer in Jesus Christ, or a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were born again people of God, these 12 men. We also know uh, that many people, scholars believe, uh, that these uh, the 12 men were disciples of Apollos, who himself had not been instructed in the deeper ways of God. Prior to him being instructed by Aquila and Priscilla, like these twelve, they only knew the basics about Jesus Christ. They knew about his birth. They knew about his life, his ministry. They knew about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his ascension, but it seemed to stop right there. Paul sin, seemed to sense that there was something lacking in the lives of these twelve men. Now again, he did not question the fact that they were born again. As a matter of fact, he acknowledged the fact that they were born again, that they were disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. The question that he asked uh, shows that they lack the freedom and the spontaneity of in worship to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is normally characteristic of those who have been born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul asked him a serious question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now the Greek literally says it this way. Having believed, did you receive? Having believed, did you receive? That's why the King James translators, good Bible scholars as they were, translated the participle, since you believed. They wanted to bring out the fact that believing upon Jesus precedes receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit from him. Now remember, there are many baptisms in the Word of God. We know that Jesus Christ uh, baptizes and the Holy Spirit baptizes. Before you and I are born again and we accept Christ as our Savior, it is the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into uh, the body of Christ. But once we have been born again, it is Jesus Christ who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we must believe before we can receive. Another thing that uh, 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 the book of Acts is trying to point out uh, is simply this. And that is the fact that once we have believed, we can receive the Holy Spirit. And it is a distinct work, a distinct experience from being filled with the Holy Spirit. When you and I are born again, we are full of the Holy Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit that baptizes in the body of Christ. But once we are filled with the Spirit of God, born again, then it is Jesus Christ who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit where the cup runs over, uh, if you will. So once again, the message of Acts 19.2 seems to speak like this. Since these 12 men were disciples of Jesus Christ, the baptism in the Holy Spirit should have been the next step, a distinct step after having believed. So the Apostle Paul basically comes up and says, listen, you guys are born again believers, you 12 men. So it's incumbent upon you to want to obey the words of Jesus Christ, right? Oh yeah. So they listen to the instructions of the Apostle Paul. They believe the instructions of the Apostle Paul. And they were baptized in water. Then the Apostle Paul laid hands upon them. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. This story took place about 19 years after uh, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was initially 
previously uh, introduced to the early church. What that really means in this context is simply this, an accurate translation, but we have not heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. That's what they were saying. Apparently, what that means is the 12 men had not heard any sermons on the Holy Spirit. They did not know the Holy Spirit. I wanted to feel them. He, they did not know. Friend, if it ain't taught, it can't be caught. I said, if it ain't taught, it can't be caught. So Paul further instructed them, and he baptized them in water. They laid hands upon them, baptized them in the Holy Spirit, and they spoke with tongues as the Spirit of God gave to them the utterance. Beloved, have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? The church needs to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to know the doctrine. We've got to know the reality of the doctrine of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to go to a church that believes in that doctrine today. We've got to blow the dust off of the doctrine and we've got to say, Lord, here I am. Baptize me in the Holy Ghost. It's an experience based upon the Word of God an experience based upon the promise of Jesus Christ to His church and for our lives on a daily basis. The Bible said this promise is for you for your children, to as many that are far off, to as many as the Lord your God shall call. Beloved, we are starving to death uh, in a place of plenty. I remind you today uh, that the whole time there's a river of God that flows, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And we are starving to death, and we're thirsting in a desert when the whole time our life should be a springing oasis where the power and the glory of God uh, should be poured out today. Let's get rid of the dust, and let's get rid of the rust and allow the power of Pentecostal experience to burn within us to take us to deeper depths and take us to higher heights that are bring glory to Jesus Christ and destruction to the kingdoms of darkness today. I read a story some time ago about a little widow who was living in New York in a small dungy apartment and she was dying of starvation. She was 90 years of age. Her name, they called her Miss Emma. And four days after they found her dying of starvation, she literally died. And all of her neighbors were not only surprised that she died of starvation, but they were surprised at what they found. In her apartment, they found the bedroom stashed in cardboard boxes, $275,000. They learned later uh, that throughout some of the banks in New York uh, that she had uh, accounts uh, up to $200,000 uh, in money in her accounts. They also found out that she owned hundreds of uh, stock shares as well in different companies uh, throughout the world. And here she died as a pauper of that particular time. We also know according to the story, her little apartment was located over a, a, a little store. It was dark and dusty. Didn't have a curtain hanging in the window. And they had little pasteboard boxes and, and papers that she would burn uh, in her stove in order not to have to pay for electricity or pay for gas. That's how she kept warm. And she lived off of cheap weenies that she could buy at that store down below her. And she died a pauper. How sad commentary that really is. A woman that had great riches, monetarily speaking, but she died as a pauper. What a sad, sad commentary. But yet it illustrates the spiritual condition of many churches in America and around the world today. We may be wealthy in worldly goods, but poverty-stricken in soul, and we have relegated the miracle-working power of God to a religion of unbelief, uh, to a religion of, of unbelief and skepticism and of simply neglect in this hour which we live. The early church was just the opposite. They, when the early church made up of men and women, they had very little monetary money. Some were rich, but many had very little monetary wealth of this world. But boy, were they full of the Holy Ghost of God. I mean, friend, when they got under the spout where the glory of God came out, it didn't matter how much money they had. What they had was something that would change the world, would change society, and bring down uh, uh, the powers of darkness in the present world. Uh, we know that Peter and John came out of their prayer meeting in the upper room, and they were going into a prayer meeting uh, at the temple and there they were met by a man that had been carried every day uh, to the gate called Beautiful and he asked for alms, he asked for an offering when they came by and Peter and John looked upon him whom they had seen many times, I know down in days gone by, who had looked over and looked around many times in weeks and months and years gone by but on that day uh, the spirit of God's eyes in Peter I looked upon him and said hey silver and gold I don't have but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise 
up and walk. Friend, we cannot give what we do not have. And we may sit in a Pentecostal church and we may know Pentecostal doctrine, but do we know the Holy Ghost of Pentecost itself? If you and I will be filled with the power of God, we can turn the world right side up again for the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of preaching. I'm tired of meetings. I'm tired of church as usual. I say, dear God, come and bring a visitation and a holy habitation of the presence of the living God. The tomb is empty, but the upper room is still full today. We need, we must have the implosion of the spirit of the living God. Oh, let me tell you, friends, it's been said the average church can no longer confess silver and gold, have I none? But the average church can neither say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I've read of churches that celebrate Pentecost Sunday like this. Some preacher, some minister will get a torch and they light it. They may be up in the balcony of a church. They may be upstairs coming down the stairwell. They may start in the foyer of the church, but that torch is on fire. And they walk in and people ooh and ah as they walk in with that torch burning on Pentecostal Sunday as if though they're reminding the congregation of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. While it may look good, it is a dead ceremony. There can be no substitute for the divine unction, for the divine anointing, and for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, the average church is well structured and we're organized for social functions and religious rituals, but many are powerless to bring deliverance to this generation that's enslaved by sin and enslaved by the consequences of sin itself. In spite of every material, every intellectual, every culture advantage, modern day Christianity, we're rapidly losing the ground and the struggle for leadership in world influence. We are losing our voice. We are losing our authority. We are losing our position. We are losing our influence. We are losing our ability to bring a positive change amidst the world that needs to be changed by the power of God. Rather than the church influencing the world, the world is influencing the church. Uh, the world comes in the front door and the Holy Ghost goes out the back door. But I say, friend, put the emergency brake on. I repent before the Almighty God and say, Lord, I am hungry. I am thirsty. I want a genuine move of the reality of the spirit of the living God. And if you are God, you've given a promise to me and to my children and to all the Lord that God shall call. We shall be filled with the Holy Ghost of God and not be filled with baloney anymore. God help us. We're much like the church of to see a mention in Revelation chapter 3. Because thou sayest, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that they're wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. The church should be different, and the church should make a difference. Yes. Amen. The difference between spiritual power and weakness, between Christian success and failure, between our victory and our defeat depends upon what's done about the spiritual experience that caused the early Christians to have a drive and to move forward victoriously in a zeal to rescue mankind from the curse of sin and from sickness and disease and demon possession. They were moved with compassion and they were moved with passion for Jesus, uh, for each other, and for the world. May God help us see the world through the eyes of Jesus. May we touch the world with the hand of Jesus. And may we today not fear anything but God and hate nothing but sin. And if you're filled with the power of God, we can walk in the flames of hell with a squirt, squirt bottle if we have to, to know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. God is powerful, but he's all powerful as well. The experience spoken of in the Old Testament the experience promised to us by Jesus Christ and the experience that was introduced on the day of Pentecost is available for you and for me today. And without this experience, not just in doctrine, not just in theory, not just in our history, not just in our archives, but without this history and without this experience, the church is a wealthy pauper, unable to cope with the demands and the challenges that we experience today. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. The church immediately became a spiritual giant. It awakened nations. It awakened people. It transformed lives and it rattled the gates of hell and it shook empires for the glory of 
God. Let me tell you, friend, my hope is not in Washington, D.C. Uh, my hope is not in Congress. My hope is not in the Senate. My hope is not in man. But I serve a God today that overcame sin. He overcame death. He overcame the grave. He has sent him back to the right hand of God the Father. And this same Jesus said, in the last day, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And if you and I can drink and we can eat until we are filled and we will do great exploits for our God. Be tired of religion, church. Be tired of service to church. Get hold of the living God and let the living God get hold of us for this hour in which we live. Be filled with the spirit. Become a spiritual giant. And thank God we produce a worldwide influence of godliness and faith. And rather than us wake up in the morning and say, good Lord, it's morning. Let's wake up and say, good morning, Lord. Yeah. And rather than us saying, oh, what's the devil going to do to us? Let's wake up so full of the power of God. The devil said, oh, my God, they're awake again. I still believe we can come to a place in God where the same things we saw in the book of Acts should, must, and will happen again in the 21st century. I know, friend, it's hard to have faith when there's a, to move a mountain when there's a bulldozer on the outside. I know sometimes it's hard to have faith in healing when our medicine cabinet's full of medicine. I know sometimes it's hard to believe that God can set the demon-possessed free when we have counselors everywhere, but we have been counseling demon-possessed people way too long. I'm here to tell you, God Almighty is going to build a church and it's going to take the spirit of the living God working through the believer to get her done. Be full of the spirit. The spirit-filled church of the first century produced an impact that transformed cities and it rattled kingdoms. Shortly after Paul and Silas went into one of those such cities, terror filled the hearts of people. I don't know if terror filled them because of the disciples showing up or because of what the God, they saw God doing through the church, but you know what they said? They said, those that turned the world upside down have come to where we're at today. The Bible said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of this world. A spirit-filled church will produce a mighty spiritual awakening. Let me tell you something, friends. Study the Word of God. Anytime tragedy comes to a world and the church begins to seek the face of God, if the heart of the man that's seeking the face of God will be open, the power of God will come down. Today's the brightest day of the church. We've been shut up. We've been silent. We've been quarantined. And they may try to do it again. But I'm going to tell you, you can't shut up God. You can't quarantine the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you, if you'll open up your heart wherever you are, He'll come down. He'll fill you up. Glory of God will come and we will turn the world upside again for the glory of God. A spirit-filled church will do it. Such a church will transform communities. We will impact lives. Uh, there will be uh, deliverance to the captive, salvation to the lost, hope to the hopeless, joy to the joyous, joyless, and healing, I believe, again, to those in sickness and disease. When God's allowed to be turned loose in his church, yeah. I said, if God will be allowed to be turned loose, in church, what do you mean, preacher? God, really wants to, God can't do nothing but cooperate with us. And if we don't cooperate with him, his hands are tied. God's not sending lightning bolts to get the job done on this earth. God's not going to violate your will for his to be done. If we will yield ourselves to him and allow him to do something phenomenal. Yeah. Somebody having pain in the right side of your back? Anyone quickly? Anybody in the right back side of your back right here? Father, in the name of Jesus, bring healing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shanda kabala ketela, solidable kundra bahanda kaha. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Let that body line up with the word of God right here, right now. I dare you to send him do what you couldn't do. I dare you to send him do what you couldn't do. Are you hearing me? I dare you to send him do what you couldn't do. Let God do it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> mm. when God's allowed to be turned loose and we're turned on to the Holy Spirit we can do as the Bible said and has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation it's strange to me that many in Pentecostal churches seem to be content with the doctrine of Pentecost many of those same people do not want the experience of Pentecost 
Let me say it again. It seems strange to me that many people attend churches with a Pentecostal doctrine, but some of those same people do not want to experience the power or the person of Pentecost. It's as if though we think perhaps we've arrived, bought the t-shirt, outgrew it, put in the yard sale to the highest bidder. But on the other hand, there is a growing hunger for the Pentecostal message among nominal denominations today. Anybody got some pain right here, right now? On the left side? Friend, I'm just talking here by faith. Anybody on this left side of the jaw? Father, you're so good. I ask you in the authority of Jesus Christ, let that body right now be healed. We take authority. We can't heal. We can't practice medicine. But you said in your word, speak the word. And I pray right now, let that body line up with the word of God. And whatever brings that pain, loose him. And let him, Lord, be free. In Jesus' name we pray. Glory to God. Mm. Can you just lift your hands? Let's give God praise. Just give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 Nominal churches are hungry for the baptism in the Holy Spirit all across the world. There's a great outpouring among Roman Catholics, a great outpouring of the Spirit among Episcopalians, among the Lutherans, among the Mennonites, among the Plymouth Brethren, a great outpouring among the uh, Episcopals, and, and the list goes on. Why? Why? Because the answer is found in the Bible. Peter quoting the prophecy of the Old Testament, Joel, and it shall come to pass the last day, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons, your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Pentecost is not a denomination. Pentecost is a way of life. I said, Pentecost is not a denomination. It is a way of life. Glory to God. Are you aware that among the Southern Baptists in America, they kind of say it's not for today? But you know, they can't stop their missionaries overseas from receiving the baptism of the Spirit. Are you aware that amongst the Southern Baptists overseas, they are still allowing them to receive the Holy Spirit baptism with the evidence of speaking of other tongues. That's amazing to me. Pentecost is not a denomination. It's a way of life. Pentecost must be preached. Not because it's one of our fundamental truths in the symbols of God. It must be preached not because I've received it. It must be preached not because you've received it. It must be preached because it's the Word of God. Paul told the young preacher by the name of Timothy, preach the Word. If we neglect Pentecostal preaching, we are not preaching the whole counsel of God. We may be preaching some of the doctrine. We may be preaching some of the Word. But if we're not preaching the proof of Pentecostalism, we are not preaching the entirety of the ethical of the Word of the living God. Preach the Word. Amen. When I was ordained many, many years ago, we had a big district superintendent by the name of Reverend Stein, big German guy, no hair on his head, wore these big thick glasses. I mean, he was a giant. It came time for my ordination in the class I was in, and he took my Bible, and he handed it to me, and he went, Preach the Word. <laughs> That'll wake you up in the middle of the night. Have a sign in my door, in my office, before I go out my door, Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Rebuke, exhort, reprove, give instruction. This message is not mine. This message is ours. We have the Word. Preach the Word, the full gospel, not just enough of the Word to tickle the ears and to make us feel good in a bad news world. The New Testament was written by men who were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and it was written to and for a people that eventually would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And think about this. There are certain things in God's Word I personally believe, and I want you to take this the way I mean it, Pentecostals that speak in tongues, baptized in the Spirit, are not better than those that don't. 
You do not have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues to go to heaven. But I will say this. There are portions of God's Word that I don't believe we can truly understand without having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just don't swim that deep. But I know the one that can hold his nose a long time and take me down there. Are you with me? I need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to understand the Spirit of God moved upon holy men of old to write the Word. It's going to take the same Holy Ghost to help me understand that Word. It was Paul after he was born again and led of the Spirit of God after being baptized in the Holy Spirit, he goes into the wilderness of Arabia and he spends three years with nothing but the Old Testament. And he came out of that wilderness with a deeper understanding of Jesus, a deeper understanding of the Scripture, and a deeper revelation of God and His Word and His will than the men had that walked with him physically for three years. I'm going to tell you, the Holy Ghost of God can take us places that we've never been. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm ready for the power power of God. Hallelujah. Going where no man has ever gone before. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I got to hurry. But the anointing which you received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you in all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Church, the church can only fulfill its mission as we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We can only be successful as we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, and direct us, and empower us for service. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not an option. It is a command. God gave us the command. God will not command us to do something and then not give us the ability to fulfill that command. Are you with me? He said, I will pour out. I will baptize. I will give. To all that are hungry, come and eat. To all that are thirsty, come and drink. Be hungry, church. Amen. Be thirsty, church. And then quit trying to eat the crumbs in the carpet for the last 15 years. And quit drinking from the high test soda pop of this world when he said out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. There are only five disciples named. Church, I'm struggling this morning. Brother, that pain's still there. Isn't it? Mm. Stretch your hand this way. Glory. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, you don't reveal it unless you want to heal it. Glory to God. I curse whatever brings this pain. I'm not a doctor. I simply represent the master physician. I lay hands upon him and the authority of Jesus Christ and whatever brings this pain, rebuke it now. I curse it. I bind it. In the name of Jesus Christ. And there it went. There it went. Rejoice. On my end, it's gone. How about yours? Hmm. <laughs> Glory. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Woo! Now I can preach. There are only five disciples named that followed Jesus to the cross. John and three women by the name of Mary and another woman. Understand also when Jesus rose from the grave... The Bible said there were ten present, twelve minus Judas who hung himself, and Thomas, who was called Downing Thomas. But notice at the gathering the upper room, following the command of Jesus, there were 120 disciples. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and the Bible said, with the growth of the outpouring, again, Pentecost is all about the harvest. The same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Pentecost is about the harvest. Pentecost is about the saving of souls. Shortly after, in Acts 4.4, 4, and the number of men was about 5,000. The church is still moving under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and it's still in the soul-saving business. At the next church census, they apparently were not able to complete the count because it says here, there was a multitude of them that believed. 
After that, the multitude were added to the Lord. And then the number of disciples was multiplied. And the last numerical account that we have in the book of Acts about the Pentecostal movement is this. A continuing, thriving, growing, soul-winning church. And it said, the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. What a mighty God working in and through his church. But the Pentecost revival is not exclusive property to we in Pentecostal doctrine. There is a great charismatic outpouring. There is a great renewal movement happening today. And while many denominations are frightened by it, let me tell you, friend, you can't frighten God. God hadn't changed his mind about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If many people are not careful, they're going to find themselves fighting God. If you may not understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you may not understand speaking in tongues. If you don't, may I give you some word of advice? Shut up about it. Because you may be blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. If this thing is not of God, it will die of natural causes. But because it is of God, it's going to keep on going. It's going to keep on growing. And God's going to keep on pouring out His Spirit upon hearts that are hungry and lives that are open unto Him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The marching of the Holy Ghost continues to move on. I've got to close. So much more to say. Part two next week, Lord willing. Real quickly. We become our worst enemy in receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was raised, and I wasn't raised, I went to a little Methodist church beside of my house because that's the only church that was there. At that particular Methodist church, I learned nothing about the Lord. I learned about the Air Force. I learned a moral to the story. But at that particular church, I learned nothing about Jesus, nothing about salvation, nothing about the Holy Spirit. A friend of mine invited me to the Assembly of God Church when I was graduating high school. He was not a Christian, and he's still not a Christian. But I went, and for the first time in my life, I was introduced not only to Jesus, but to Pentecost. Amen. I'm telling you what, I thought, I've been going to a museum all my life. Man, this thing's alive. And it wasn't pumped up flesh. First time I heard understand tongues, nobody had to tell me what it was. I knew that was the Holy Spirit of God. I knew. And I watched the preacher preach, and he preached like heaven was good and hell was not a good place to go. And he preached like you want to get saved and need to be saved, and Jesus is good and life can be great with him. And I watched the man live, and I thought, this guy is walking what he's talking, and he's talking what he's walking. Next thing I know, the Spirit of God came upon me and I accepted the Lord as my Savior. And now I read the Word of God and I said, you know what? This Holy Ghost baptism thing is supposed to be for me. And boy, I was hungry. But you know what got in the way? Jeff Davis. I got in the way. It took me over a year to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I go around the altars and oh, God baptized me. And I'm waiting for God to do something. Nothing. I felt like something's wrong with me. God changed his mind about me. I must not be clean enough. I must be not good enough. I've done something wrong. So I'd pray a little longer, fast a little more, and nothing happened. All works, works, works. Let me tell you, if I could teach you how to yield to the Holy Spirit, I'd be the most sought after man in the world. I can't tell you how to yield. I didn't know how to yield myself. And I struggled with God for well over a year, thinking I wasn't good enough. And then a voice right here going, Something wrong with you. You're not really a Christian. It ain't for you. God's word don't tell the truth. God, let me know what I'm talking about. So we had a revival. Some of you have heard the story. We had a revival. John Masto, an Italian evangelist from West Virginia. He thought my name was Jimmy. (laughs) Sunday night I go around that altar, man, I'm seeking God, everything I got for the Holy Spirit baptism, and nothing. I go disappointed. Monday night, same thing. Tuesday night, same thing. Wednesday night, I am wore out. This 19-year-old boy was wore to a frazzle. I'll go around the altar. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, amen. Went to my seat and sat there. Come on to Jimmy tonight. Do you get the Holy Ghost? I said, I've been there for our brother Masto. Four nights, been a night. No. Come on to Jimmy. Tonight will be your night. No, no, no. Come on to Jimmy one more time. No, brother Master. Come on to Jimmy one more time. You stand up here. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wasn't thinking about nothing but Jesus. I wasn't thinking about what I had to do or didn't have to do, hold on, let go. I just felt something on the inside. It wasn't gas. 
It wasn't a feeling. It was gibberish. I, I'm, don't forgive me. I'm just being plain old vanilla. I don't have to explain. It was just like gibberish. Just words, just little phrases, just like, like, a, like a little newborn baby. Go, dad, dad, mama, goo, goo, choo, choo. I mean, it's the same type thing with me, spiritually speaking. And all of a sudden, I'm over here just, and I start with it, my spiritual goo goo. I'm not being sacrilegious. I'm just trying to be honest. It made no sense to me. I had tried so long to baptize myself. I didn't know what it was like. You know, went and let the Lord do it. So I began to put a little volume to that. And the next thing I know, I don't know how long it was, but I came to over here. Now I wasn't, I mean, again, please understand, I was drunk in the spirit. It was phenomenal. I thought, man, I, this is better than drugs. This is better than alcohol. I had some moonshine in my life. But boy, this stuff takes the cake. All because I yielded. All those years I had been my worst enemy. So church, let me just tell you, don't let the devil condemn you for having not received the Holy Spirit when you want him so bad. Amen. Just learn to get out of the way and let God have his way. If I could tell you how to do it, I, do, I know how to tell you. Come on. I don't know how to tell you. Just come to the place where say, God, I just want what you have. But how many times have you and I gone to altars and we prayed and we prayed and nothing happened. We go to our seats and it's not for me and we feel so dirty, we feel so unclean. A girl I used to date many, many years ago, she was around the altar seeking the Lord, nothing happened. Two o'clock in the morning she called me. I couldn't understand the words she was saying. Except between phrases, she said, the Lord baptized me before I went to bed tonight. Friend, I've seen people baptized in the car riding down the road. I've seen them baptized in a bedroom at night around church altars. If you're hungry, and God help you, create a hunger in your life. Create a hunger and let the Lord slay it.